We have over 400 children in foster care in Escambia County. I deal with many of them, and I think it's important for you to know that if you take anything from this video today, I hope it will be that children are not disposable items and they truly need a voice. Hi, my name is Michael Harris. I am a case manager with the Guardian Ad Litem program in Escambia County, Florida. Child advocacy is very important to me, both personally and professionally. And I want to thank you in advance for viewing this training material. At the end of this video, you will be given contact numbers and email address for your convenience. Also, I figure it better to tell you now that there will be a short quiz when this video is over. As a Guardian Ad Litem volunteer, you will come in contact with foster homes in our area. This video will help you to better understand what a foster parent's role is with the children placed in their home and how a guardian you know, should work with that family. Also, we'll explain to you the process in which one becomes a licensed foster parent. I know this process very well. I'm a licensed foster parent in Escambia County, and I'm also an adoptive parent. But instead of me claiming to be the professional, I've asked Melissa Albach with Families First uh, Network Foster Home Development to explain in more detail. Again, there will be a short test at the end of the video. We really hope to get calls from you and want to want more information. It's truly people like you that give our Florida children voices in court. Thank you for your time. Hello. Like Mike said, I'm Melissa Albeck. I'm a relicensing counselor with Foster Home Development. Um, I just want to give you a brief introduction to foster parents, what they go through to become foster parents, um, and some helpful hints to you as far as working with them. Um, first of all, we have different types of foster home. We have traditional homes, which you'll also hear referred to as regular homes, and there are specialized homes. The specialized homes, as you see on the, on the board, are uh, matrix, chips, and medical. These homes are specialized to care for children and best meet the child's needs. Matrix and chips are for the children with more severe behavioral issues, and then medical homes are the ones where the families are licensed and trained in caring for medically complex children. What it takes to be a foster parent. The families that call our office and say that they're interested in becoming foster parents initially go to an orientation class. The orientation class gives them a brief overview of what we expect of our foster parents, what the state requires of them, and especially the background screens that are going to be conducted on the families. Um, once they finish orientation, they are signed up for a PRIDE class. PRIDE is a 27-hour course. It's required for everyone that is going to be a foster parent. It in introduces them to um, the state expectations, how to work with the kids, how the kids come into care, um, and what all team members that they're going to be working with, which includes the guardian ad litem, because guardian ad litems are considered part of the team. Additionally, once they complete the pride class, if they're going to be a specialized foster home, matrix, chips or medical they have an additional 20 to 40 plus hours of training that they take to specialize inside those programs um, then we do the background screenings the background screenings are done on everyone age 12 and above we do delinquency checks on children 12 to 17 once you're 18 years old including the foster parents we do background screenings which include local law enforcement clerk of the court checks, um, and that's looking for domestic violence history. We do fingerprints, which is um, FDLE and FBI, so that's national checks and statewide checks. We're going to check your driving record, you have your DMV records done also, um, and child abuse registry. Child abuse registry and local law enforcement go back five years every state and every county within that state that a family has lived in. Um, that's from the Adam Walsh requirement that you might be familiar with. Um, all of these screens are completed annually on a family um, in case anything has happened during the year that we are not notified about. We always find out. Um, we're very thorough with our families. Um, and once they're through the background screenings, then we're going to begin the home study process. 
The home study process includes a health inspection, fire inspection, environmental inspection. Everyone in the home is interviewed. Reference checks are required from employers, adult children, relatives, non-relatives, school, daycare. Every household member being interviewed includes the foster or potential foster parents' children um, because the children's opinions do matter. Um, <clears throat> everyone needs to be on board in the decision to foster. During the home study, we also thoroughly discuss any family member's history of child abuse, neglect, domestic violence, or substance abuse that they've experienced, either having had that issue themselves or a family member with that issue that has a direct effect on them because how they have dealt with those issues is very important for them to be able to have worked through those issues to work with our, our children and the children's families. Um, <clears throat> home studies include health history. We find out from the family what medications they've ever taken. These can include antidepressants, back uh, pain medications, anything the family has taken in the past and current and we have to know what those issues are. If the family has any health history that may affect their ability to foster and take care of children, we could have to have a physical reference from the doctor. Um, we have to know as part of the home study process how this family is willing to work with biological families. They have to be willing to work with all of the team members. They have to be willing to work towards the case plan goal. Um, Foster parents may come into fostering with an idea that they want to adopt, but that's not foster care. Foster care is strictly for foster, so they have to be willing to work with the child's biological families. Um, once they are through the licensing process, they are then relicensed annually. The relicensing process that the families go through since they're relicensed every year um, we do the background screens, all of them with the exception of FDL, FDLE and FBI. Those two are only done every four years, but annually we are doing the same law enforcement checks. Um, it also includes another health inspection, fire inspection, a completed relicensing packet, which are forms basically that they fill out just about every year. Um, they have an annual training requirement. It is eight hours for the traditional regular foster parent. For specialized homes, it's t a minimum of 12, or more, and it can be more hours of annual training that they have to go through within their specialization field. Um, review forms are required from providers that the families worked with, um, and we also get feedback from family services counselors that the families have worked with during the year. The families also get to provide their feedback with, from the providers that they've worked with, including the family services counselors. Um, the relicensing home visit includes interviewing everyone in the home, foster kids, the biological kids, and the foster parents. Um, we discuss how everything's been going that year. We discuss what went wrong, and we discuss what went right, how they may handle situations differently, offer continued support when they're facing new situations, because with a foster parent, it's always a learning curve. Everything is different every case they get involved with. So sometimes they need additional direction from others involved. And then fostering is a way of life. Um, the way they keep their home. Medications and chemicals must be kept under lock and key at all times. They have to have alarms on their doors and windows if they have a swimming pool. There's a lot of additional requirements for the swimming pool, including various safety equipment, um, water safety courses. Um, they have to have fire alarms in all sleeping areas. The temperature of their water is even measured by the health department to make sure that it is not above 120 degrees. Annual training requirements we've already discussed. Um, we, they have to know, we have to know how they parent their children, their biological children as well as our foster children. Of course, foster children can only be parented with positive parenting techniques, which we teach the family. We just have to make sure that those are still going, are, are still in play once they um, are actually receiving the children in their home. Um, where children sleep is a, 
is very important. Every foster child has to have their own bed. If a family's biological children want to share a bed, that's fine as long as it's by their choice. Um, can't be displaced by a foster child, but every foster child has to have their own bed. Um, and as far as where the age of the child and where that bed is located is also monitored by us. Um, if you babysit anyone regularly, we have to know that because you're only allowed a maximum of five children in the home and that would include children that you babysit on a regular basis. If a foster family plans a vacation, um, they have to get approval before they can go. Will the, visita will the vacation interfere with a parent visitation or sibling visitation? Will a parent get permission for a child to take that child out of, t out of state for a vacation? Um, or does a judge have to get involved and allow that child to leave town? Um, so those things are important um, as a way of life for the foster children. Foster families also open their homes to several different team members. Um, and some of these visits are scheduled and some of them are unscheduled. Uh, family services counselors, placement workers, licensing counselors, therapists, and guardian ad litems, and a child's biological family will be in and out of the home, usually on at least a monthly basis. Um, you could also multiply that by two, three, four, or five, depending on how many children the, the family has and their each individual team members, which are these listed on the board. Um, can you imagine opening your home to that many people and never knowing who's going to show up and what you have going on at that moment? Um, we tell our families they do not have to sit around waiting for somebody to show up, but it needs to be at least somewhat. If you've worked with the child for a while, you're going to know what that child's schedule is. So if you know that they've got a ball game on a Wednesday night, don't go by on a Wednesday night. Um, take into some consideration what the family has as far as normal schedules. Um, they could have five children going in five different directions every day of the week. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're going out to visit these homes. Um, they are encouraged to have children involved in extracurricular activities if possible. Sometimes with the child's counseling sessions and visitation, it can be difficult to schedule those extracurricular, but we want this to be as normal of a home for the child as possible, and socialization is very important. Then let's talk about transportation. Our foster families are um, required to transport children. Um, think about a regular schedule of a regular family out there. You may have children playing ball that need to go to ball and then they've got counseling sessions, routine doctor's appointments. Um, now include parent visits, sibling visits, and counselor visits. Um, it can get very, very hectic and our families are asked to transport to as many of those things as possible. They are asked to attend staffings, court hearings, um, and keep in mind that usually both parents in a foster home work. Um, so then they can't jeopardize their job taking off from work. So that's something that needs to be considered also is what is the family's dynamic? Where are, where are the parents during the day when most court hearings are? So that needs to be taken into consideration. But you always should ask the foster parent for feedback when you're out there on a visit um, because it's very important to have their input. Um, a lot of misconceptions as far as foster parents getting paid to be foster parents. It ain't about the money. As you can see, it's very minimal the amount of the board rate that they are paid. A portion of the board rate also includes the child's allowance, which is based on the child's age, and that's the amounts at the lower part of the screen. Um, the board rates are to cover allowance, clothes, incidentals, diapers, school pictures, yearbooks, school dance, field trips, anything that child's involved in. And then um, also consider that when most children come into care, they come into care with only the clothes on their backs. Parents don't stop and say, oh, let me pack a bag while their children are being removed. So children are usually coming in with the clothes on their backs, may or may not even have shoes. 
They're not coming with diapers, formula, all of those things come out of the foster parent's pocket at initial placement with no check. So um, keep in mind, you know, when you go out and the child's only been in the home maybe a week or two, you may not have a full wardrobe, but they'll get it as they can build things up. Um, but it is definitely not about the money. Very expensive raising children. One of the things I was asked to include is why children might move from one foster home to another. Um, sometimes when children first come into care, it's an emergency placement. It might be in the middle of the night. Um, and so we just find the best possible place that we can in an emergency situation. And then once a better foster parent, not a better foster parent, but a foster parent that can better meet that child's needs can be located to move that child into a more stable long-term placement. Children can also move because when they first came into care, siblings weren't placed in the same foster home. And then a foster home comes available that can take a sibling group. So all the children may move to another home so that the siblings can be together. That's a very important bond. Um, when siblings come into care, usually they are the only connection that they have. So we try to keep all the siblings together. Another reason they may move is they may be stepping down or up to a medical or matrix home or even a CHIPS home because those homes can better meet the child's immediate needs. Um, the current family may not be able to manage the child's behaviors, which may be a reason why they are stepping up to a matrix home or a CHIPS home. Um, foster parents experiencing a stressful or difficult time, they may have had a death in the family, unexpected trip out of town, um, they could have a medical crisis of their own going on within their family and they're just not able to give the foster children everything that they need so we have to move them to another home. Also when there's a relative or non-relative placement that comes available they may, may move to one of those homes. Um, the agency tries to minimize the number of moves with every child because we do understand that every move is a loss and it is traumatic to the child. Um, whenever possible, we try and transition those move, moves. If time allows, they would start off with a, slight, a, a short visit with a family that they're planning to move the child to, and that would build up to a day visit, an overnight visit, a weekend visit before the move. We call those transitions and it gives the child a little bit more comfort when they're moving instead of having to move at the very last minute. As you can see from this training, foster parents go through a lot to do what they do. It's not about the money, it's usually about the love that they have for the children and really truly wanting to make a difference. Please be sure to make the foster parents a part of your team. Who better to tell you about your child that you're working with than the person that's living with the child? Engage the foster parents in conversation when you come to their home. These are families. They're not professionals. They're, they're not professional foster parents. They are just families taking these kids in. They may have a different lifestyle than what you're used to. Um, they may have different interests, ways of interacting. They're going to have a combination of personalities in the home. They may be more structured or less structured than what you're used to. Relax, listen, ask questions, watch how the family interacts with the child. Um, don't make assumptions. If you have a question about something, please ask follow-up questions instead of making any assumptions as to what the family might be um, planning um, by some of the questions they may ask you. Um, there's ways to find out what you need to know. Um, there's ways to ask questions without offending someone. Uh, the first thing that I feel like you should ask a child is, how do they refer to the foster parents? What do you call Mr. Joe or Mr. John, uh, Miss Jane? What, what names do you call them by? Um, a lot of foster parents have, especially the older ones, they may be an aunt they have the children call them Auntie Jane, or they could be Nana. Um, so you need to know what the child, who they're talking about when they mention these people, so you need to know what their names are. Um, you need to know, is the child getting enough to eat? But there's a way to ask it without offending someone. Um, ask the child, who does the cooking? 
who cooks the best if they say both foster parents cook because um, that's kind of fun to watch what their reaction is um, ask them what's your favorite food that Miss Jane has fixed kids like to talk about food um, if uh, and you should get the information that you need just by some mild ice breaking questions instead of jumping in and saying are you getting enough to eat here um, once I had a child tell someone that there was no food in the foster home. No one asked follow-up questions to the girl, but we have to go out and do an investigation about a foster parent not having any food in the home. What the truth of it was, the child wanted pizza every night. The foster parents wouldn't allow her to have pizza every night, but that's not nutritional and it is not how families function. Um, so it was a lot of, um, heartache and assumptions on people's parts rather than just asking the child follow-up questions when she says there's no food in the home. There was not her pizza in the home that she wanted. Um, when you want to see a child's bedroom, and that's completely appropriate for you guys to want to know where your child is sleeping, um, just ask little Fred or Frida, can you show me to your room? The foster parents know that you want to talk to the child alone. This is a good time to do that interview in the room. If there's more than one bed in the room, you can say, well, which one's yours? Kids love to show off their space and love to show you the things that they have. So they'll be glad to do that. And that's a way to ask a foster parent or, or let the foster parent know that you're going to go see the child's room. Melissa, you had mentioned that uh, when you're out visiting with the family that it's more important to build a conversation as opposed to being interrogational you know, to the family. Uh, you open it up, opportunities to speak and bring forth information you know, and to, to avoid any miscommunication. Also, you had brought up the fact about the mention of a home that the child was relaying to an individual that there was not enough food in the house. How could that have been avoided uh, through questioning uh, you know, to further build rapport with the child to see exactly what was going on. Well, when she says there's no food in the home, you could have asked her, um, what did you have for dinner last night? Um, and then she may have said, more than likely, this is what they wanted me to eat and that's not what I wanted. And then, well, what did you want? And then you could have gotten to the core of the story because once the first person went out there and started interviewing her again and asking follow-up questions it came out that she wanted her pizza every night and that's just not healthy for a child to eat and families you sit down to family dinners and everybody eats pretty much the same thing foster parents will try and incorporate a child's particular likes for foods into the meal planning but it's not going to be pizza every night melissa had mentioned earlier about you know it not being about the money it truly is not about the money. It is about the love that we have you know, for the children in the system and all children in general. Well, Mike, you're a guardian and a foster parent. When you go out and you're talking to these kids and trying to break the ice and build that rapport, what are some of the questions that you ask? Melissa, well, start off with, you know, you find out some common ground with them. You know, what hobbies, you know, what shows they like, TV, you know, to find some small ground of interest, you know, back and forth. Some kids, it may be food, uh, but to bring, you know, something to the table that you can share and talk about and then expand from there. You know, just and, and have a knowledge base, too, because most people don't know I'm a gamer. Yeah. But that's a real good one for a teenager. You <laughs> yeah. go in there and you know the Xbox games and all yeah, that. They've got the, the fancy phone where they can play with uh, and stuff, so definitely. Uh, and just, you know, take it from there. You know, the children, you know, will start talking and next thing you know, they will, you know, start sharing, you know, stories and you can you know, lead into to find. And the same with the, uh, the parents, uh, you know, just ask them some general questions and expand on it. And treat them like a partner. Exactly. I mean, they've gone through a lot to be a foster parent. You know, you do it every year. Yeah, I try to make everyone as comfortable that I can, you know, around and seemingly it works, you know, for the most part. Um, yeah, that's... And I know me as a licensing counselor when I'm going out and I'm talking to my foster families, I always tell them the guardian's the best friend because the foster parents have the child's best interest at heart and the best partner that they have is the guardian ad litem. 
caseworkers are stuck in a box as far as some of the things that they can do as far as the cases and what they can say and what the direction has to be. The guardian ad litem has a lot of power and a big voice for that child. And so they really need to be working with the foster parent and vice versa and building up that rapport. And our foster parents are easy. I mean, I'm very laid back when I go out there. I meet them on their level. You know, it's just like old home week. When I go visit a home, I want to just be relaxed and how's things going, you know, general things. Their family, ask them, you know, just basic questions. And I agree. And I try to, you know, incorporate that on you know, each visit to let the child know that I am his voice. Uh, you know, I'm very important to him and the family. The parents know and the foster parents. So, you know, they can work and engage us all together you know, for the benefit of the child. Absolutely. Um, do you have any other hints or ideas for them as far as some questions to ask? So I would encourage all new volunteers to go with the flow when they're out visiting with the child and you know, just read upon him or her you know, on the next direction, listen to the child, and not be so worried about you know, learning a lot of information from the child on the first visit. You know, make it comfortable, make it fun if you can, and, uh, you know, and then set another appointment to go out and really you know, dig further into and That way it is a good visit. The child knows who you are because it's all about building rapport. You know, and you build upon. Uh, so I would encourage uh, the volunteers to you know just listen to the child and enjoy the visit. They certainly will. Um, like Melissa mentioned earlier, it's not about the money. And um, you know, foster parents, you know, they're certainly compensated for their time, but it doesn't overcompensate them for it. Um, we need it's done out of love, you know, for the children in the dependency system and the same love that our guardian ad litem volunteers will you know, show toward the children. Well, that concludes our brief for today. All of us here in Escambia County appreciate your interest and look forward to you working with us. One thing I would like to add, if you ever have any questions about a foster home, the licensing process, or anything like that, please do not hesitate to contact us. I'd like to hear from you. Your number. It's 453-7766 on the board. Very good. Thank you. <laughs>